which news is on the air. It looks like it's recording. Hi boys and girls, it's me Butch. My name is Terry David Silvercloud. I'm 73 years old and I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Today is, uh, what is today? Tuesday the 22nd of May 2018. It's a nice sunny day out there today, going on noon, and I'm going to try and get to the beach for an hour or so before I post this. So I'm 73 years old, and uh, I spent much of my life in the world of photography, but uh, I'm really into physics, and I'm going to do my best to help you better understand the concept of time today and what is time and all that. So when I was uh, 18, I went straight out of high school into the Royal Canadian Navy and at age 19 I was an acting sub-lieutenant and then in uh, another year or so later I got my ticket to be able to drive a ship by myself. It's called a watchkeeping certificate and uh, I was the navigator of HMCS Cape Scott for uh, in 1966, 1967. Well, I was about 22 years old, 21, 22. So I was a navigator. So I know uh, a whole lot about navigation. And then after that, I went off to submarine school in England and I served aboard several submarines before I eventually left the Navy. And the thing about being a submariner, I was an officer, is you learn to think like a fish. You know, if you want to go up, down, sideways, whatever you want to do, think, think how a, a fish might do that. So my, my nose is dry, great. I got a sojourn on. So my point of all this is to tell you that uh, I'm, a, I'm a navigator and a pretty good one and, and I'm pretty good with buoyancy which is something that's really big in physics. It's a really hot day today here suddenly. It's been a bit cool the last two days so I have my window open. Let me turn my fan a bit here. Oops. Give me some air. Give me air. There go. That's better. I'm just wearing the hat to cover my bald head. So where were I? I have a, I'm a bit ADHD. So time to a navigator is really important. The British Navy, one of the ways they became powerful was they offered a huge, at the time, cash reward for anyone who could invent a seagoing chronometer that was accurate because in order to have accurate navigation you need to know the time really exactly. In the olden days, which is when I was a navigator, we didn't have GPS. And if we were lucky we had a thing called Iran, but often we were just going by what's called dead reckoning because it was too stormy, and too cloudy for anything. You just knew where you were by a thing called dead reckoning. But when you want to get your position by one of the stars, what uh, a navigator would do is they have an instrument called a sextant, and a sextant is an instrument that can see the star and the horizon at the same time. So what they're seeing when they're looking through that little telescope is they're seeing both the horizon and also a particular star that they've picked because they know what it is, they've identified what it is, and they have charts and tables that will tell them where that star will be right down to the precise second anywhere on the face of the earth if you just do the math in the books. So what the person with the sextant sees is the star and they can make the star swing above the horizon just by swinging the horizon so they they're making it look like the star is sweeping the horizon and just at the point and they're turning a little dial to make this star get closer and closer to the horizon so just at the point where they can see the star touching the horizon with their dial they'll say mark 
and there'll be some dude or woman, usually it's a dude in the old days, standing beside them with a stopwatch or a chronometer and they will have marked right down to the fifth of a second. That's what an a, a chronometer is, is a, a, a watch or a clock that is accurate to a fifth of a second and also can be accurate over a certain period in the course of a day. So once you got yourself one of those, you can do some pretty accurate uh, celestial navigation by the stars and uh, they can they can pick a few stars and they get these curves and the curves mean at that particular s second if you were looking at that particular star you are somewhere on that line so you you get several of them crossing and you get what's called the J point and they don't always cross at the same point but you're somewhere in that tiny little where these things cross that's where you is and you can be accurate up to a couple hundred feet if you're really good especially in nice weather the whole point of all this is time is really important for measuring time is a measurement of change so there is no place you can go in time that's why time travel is it's just a silly idea that <laughs> you can't do that because there is no place to go in time time is simply a measurement it's the same as inches and pounds and feet and uh, any kind of measurement you can think of it's just a measurement and initially uh, we would have kept track of the sun going up and down and sundials and stuff like that and in this modern age we use the decay rate of a particular uh, type of cesium uh, uh, a, radio, a particular radioactive uh, material and it decays at a particular rate and uh, and its decay rate is, is the tick 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 and uh, so we know that varies in atomic clocks and uh, Einstein gave us some really screwy ideas about time, most of which most people interpret incorrectly anyway, but even if Einstein's views were correct, where time could become a variable, he just wasn't a very good navigator, and you cannot let one of your constants, which was the speed of light, become a variable because the speed of light is based on time and then if you allow time to start being a variable there is no answer there's infinite answers and uh, uh, I read uh, my familiarity with Einstein was reading his night December 1916 uh, theory of relativity that he published in 1916 and in it, if you're familiar with it, he'll, he starts by doing lots of talking and assuming you know a few things about science. Uh, it helps. But he talks about how somebody in a railroad carriage on the move would view flashes of lightning versus somebody standing beside the railroad track, even if they were exactly the same distance apart velocities and things like that but he did not consider a whole lot of things he sort of ignored in inertia and tried to make it up for it later in his calculations with things called Lorentz transformations where the inertial field is moving but when you're accelerating your inertia is constantly changing you don't have a fixed inertia and so he was not allowing for the fact that the inertia of the observer on the railroad carriage was not the same as the inertia for the person standing beside the railroad carriage. In other words, the person doing the viewing inside the railroad carriage had more inertia just because of their inherent velocity one way or the other, or less inertia if it was going and he did not allow for the turning of the earth at all like that any of that kind of stuff 
and he only examined things directly in front and directly behind and not any other which way. He did not consider Doppler effect. And what would really happen if you, if it, I mean, even he would have admitted this part, like to achieve the speed of light, you would require basically an infinite amount of energy because no matter how much energy you kept putting in your <laughs> stoke in the fires to go faster, boosting your rockets to go faster, you would still need more and more and more and more. And even when you achieve the speed of light, if such a thing were possible, you can't just let off because you are meeting infinite resistance. You have reached a point where you either have to push back everything in front of you or you hit a brick wall and, and physically you stop. You just can't go anywhere. <laughs> That's it. You ain't going anywhere. So I don't want to rant because I talk on and on and on and on. I'm not sure exactly what my point is here, but I want to get you thinking about time. And I guess what I'm saying is relativity is, is just full of flaws and it only work for certain things under certain situations. And you should not get all wrapped up in the idea that Einstein figured it all out years ago because he made some tremendous errors. And the people that study quantum physics, where they're usually study that's sort of my area where I don't study quantum physics, I study particle physics. But my interest lies in things that are smaller than one micron. So when you're getting down to that size as the observer, and I don't want to get into inside the box with the cat and Schrodinger and all that stuff, I don't want to get off on that drift. Um, the thing is, because of the way you observe things that are so small, relativity is like, how would you even deal with it? And when you do, what does it mean in terms of time? So then you have to ask yourself, well, how big is big? How small is small? How fast is fast? How slow is slow? So I'd like you to consider this. If you were living on a carbon atom, let's pretend this is any old atom. I just, I like carbon, so I always refer to carbon. So if this was a carbon atom just minding its own business, and you were an inhabitant on this, you can imagine how small you'd be. I mean, this is your planet. So you live on this planet, which is a carbon atom. So for you, a second would be like years. It'd be like your great, 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 great grandfather. And that's like ancient history, a second. To you, even a nanosecond would be a quite a long time. But your time would be measured in things like nanoseconds or picoseconds. A picosecond is a trillionth of a second so your time frame might be in picoseconds and uh, we don't even have clocks that measure that fast but we certainly have clocks that are getting pretty good in measuring in uh, nanoseconds and that and uh, picoseconds that's pretty difficult for a whole variety of reasons which I won't get into. So you're living on this carbon atom and the concept is like what is time? Well, if you think like this, this T-shirt I'm wearing, it's a, it's a, it's got a lot of yellow in it. You're thinking of it as scarlet, but what's happening is you're seeing a lot of yellow and a lot of red at the same time. So the wavelengths that are predominantly coming at you from this T-shirt would be in the six to eight hundred nanometer wavelengths. That means one single wave from beginning to end, from starting in the surface, building up, and then it does a bit of a plunge and coming back up. That distance for this color would be, let's pick 700 nanometers. And remember you're living on this carbon atom? Well, it's about, I don't remember, it's probably about 170 picometers, let's call it 150 picometers from here to here. So a red wavelength, what your eyes are seeing is red, 
would be so long that as far as this item is concerned, it would either just roll with the flow of red going by it, like just roll with it and maybe move a little bit if it wasn't attached to something, or it might it might rise up above a wave or below a wave. And you'd have to think of it as being a particle in a flow of energy. Now, if its weight was sufficient to resist being pulled forward, it 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 might move, it might not. The whole point I'm trying to make here is in terms of time, is it you would be so incredibly small that the very concept of red light would it wouldn't be possible for you. You're you're just too small. So time this is where Einstein was getting it all wrong. Time starts relating more relatively to your size, how big you are, the observer and the observed. If you if you lived let's talk about light, light speed for a second. If this was a wire where only one electron could get through at a time and this is an electron. In direct current, when one electron pops in this end, another one pops out the other end, and it happens at the speed of light. So what you can take from that really is, is that from because of our senses, our time, how we view time, is being set by how fast these little things called electrons can both move or not and what allowance are we making for the fact that they are objects and they are both here and there at the same time. From our point of view this is the clock setter, the electron. From our point of view, the electron sets time. Nothing can happen that we can be aware of unless it can get through or by an electron, unless an electron can be physically moved or an electron may be turned. So when atomic clocks seem to not keep correct time, when they are moving faster or at different altitudes, really you have to think about it is that there are certain areas where the atomic clock's inertia for everything within the whole mechanism has risen simply by its inertia, which includes velocity. Like as I sit here and as you watch me, we are moving through the Milky Way at about 230 kilometers per second. Even though you think you're sitting there and you think I'm sitting here, that's just relative rest. There is no rest. And time is a perception of how big you are. We're not really tiny at atom level and we're so small that we can look out and we can see a galaxy which we know is like sometimes over 100 light years, 200 light years across. What I'm saying is for light to travel from one end of that galaxy or observing to the other end of its own galaxy would take 200 light years yet because it's so far away we can view it as being what seems like one object at a moment in time, sort of at the same time from different positions. I don't know if you got that. The, some of you will get it. <laughs> if it's far enough away and big enough, technically you can see it being in the here and there at the same time, but only as the observer out there. It gets into weird relativity. <laughs> what I want to get through to you, because I'm a theoretical physicist and I have my own theories and I'm going to delve into them really quickly here, is that it is my belief that the electron, because, because it's a monopole, and we know it's a monopole because electrons repel each other and uh, they never actually 
join with a proton, or if they do, they become a neutron. So there's no super strong attraction between a proton and an electron, except from the point of view of the electron. And if you view the electron as trying to get away from everything else, because it has magnetism, that it's push anything that has magnetism that is another monopole, it's trying to get away from it, and then to back yourself up against a wall, at least you can lie down and let the people walk over you and, and, and use the thing you're leaning on as a place of rest. That's exactly what I'm doing with my butt. Because of our, I have severe arthritis, it's a lot easier to put all my 200 pounds or a lot of it uh, on my butt by sitting down. Uh, so I'm taking advantage of uh, my inertia flying through space by uh, changing my position on what I'm rubbing up against. Did you get all that? <laughs> I don't mean to confuse you. I'm trying to enlighten you. You should not take theory theories as fact. Big Bang Theory is so full of holes that um, it's silly to believe it. There's so many disproofs against Big Bang Theory aside from the fact that it has no explanation for what came before and what came after and it requires breaking the basic laws of physics just to be anyway. Uh, Big Bang is just a silly theory and uh, you know people like Einstein he just wasn't a very good navigator and he didn't consider a whole lot of things like Doppler effect and waves and they were all brand new back in 1916 so you can't really blame him. He got wise to light later on and then now we have a lot of confusion in physics where people think photons are particles and they aren't. They are and they aren't and where all that comes from is that after 1930, quantum mechanics, Schrodinger decided we don't care if the cat's dead or alive. We'll worry about that later. Who cares? Report that guy to the SBCA. Is the cat alive? Anyhow, so um, they didn't worry what was inside the box. And uh, they developed a whole lot of terminology which allowed for waves. And fortunately, because I say the electron sets the speed of light and it creates gravity by pushing everything and that gravity is pushing up pull. This is all my theory. Just so you don't think I'm giving you fundamentalist rhetoric from <laughs> the professors have to profess what they're told to profess. There's a lot of interesting science going on you'll never hear about because we seem to like science by it's a popularity contest these days for some reason. Uh, careers and jobs are at stake by uh, what you say because science can get very weird at the level at which I like to deal which is the subatomic level of reality. So here's the thing with time. Time is a measurement of change and it's a measurement so it cannot speed up, it cannot slow down. From whatever reference point you are going to make your observations that if anything is going to change you can't allow time to change and where where you should be looking if you're if you can't figure out what you, can, what you can change to make your equations balance you should be looking at inertia because as soon as you accelerate the inertia change so you should be throwing a few ballistics basic equations into your inertia just to make adjustments for the fact that what you're observing, there one may have more inertia than the other, even though they're all within the same relativistic field. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> it can turn your mind to rubber. This stuff can do it. So time, you can't travel in time. Time is a measurement of change. And Einstein, Einstein's interpretations about time seeming to go faster or slower are just poor interpretations and because he was sort of thinking of linear vector kind of motions and you know rather than because he wasn't working in quantum mechanics yet he he wasn't allowing for what was going there and if he had if he'd been aware of quantum mechanics in 1916 the formula E equals MC squared would not be E equals MC squared it would be E equals four thirds pi c cubed, because then that would allow for 
at the same time filling the volume of a sphere with bad energy like for that time frame which in this case we'll say it was a second because we based it on C and C is based on a second and a second is just an arbitrary measurement just like on a ruler a second is just an arbitrary measurement that we humans came up with after years of getting used to 24-hour days and Stanford Fleming giving us stand, standard time. It was a Canadian railroad engineer that not that long ago get, standardized the clocks all around the world so that we all agreed that Greenwich, because there's an observatory there that can, can view straight up. They've got a big telescope there, a big enough one anyway, to know when the sun is exactly overhead above Greenwich, that we would measure all time from Greenwich and we have been for quite a long time now, it's called Greenwich time, uh, GMT time, Greenwich mean time. So we, we've agreed on a particular time, but when you get into the subatomic world where things are really, really, really tiny, seconds are just too long, so it's better to deal in nanoseconds or picoseconds. A picosecond is a trillionth of a second. So in a nanosecond, which we have clocks that can do that now, light the speed of light in one nanosecond, light only goes just a bit less than one foot in one nanosecond. So now if you and your brain can see light as, oh, it only goes that far, gee. And then you think, well, if that's a nanosecond, how far does it go in a picosecond? Well, <laughs> ain't going much of anywhere. And then you suddenly start realizing that Electrons don't have to travel very, very far to be traveling at the speed of light. So electrons are basically always traveling at the speed of light, even when they're not moving really just by their mere presence because nothing is going to get past it unless it can displace, if you think of buoyancy, even if you don't think of there being something solid there. There's energy in between, and even if you don't believe in dark energy, even if you don't believe in dark matter for sure and, and this is without any shadow of any kind of doubt there's radio waves of all kinds you just know they're there because they're getting to us so they must be there and radiated energy whether you think of it as dark energy or dark matter doesn't matter it is between the solid things there is even if there's no molecules or atoms there there is energy it could be heat wavelengths, it could be gravity waves, it could be radio waves, not a lot of Wi-Fi out in space because it doesn't go very far as you know, which explains redshift, you know the reason for red, light, light is always bending in its travels and, and it starts losing more and more of the bluishness and you see more and more of the reddishness because red longest is stronger, so you know redshift is just normal for things far away because the blue guys couldn't make it, they just weren't strong enough. And 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 you see more and more redshift. And the universe is always expanding from us because we are moving to an area of less energy. Like it's a known fact in physics to be further away from a point of rest, you need more energy. And and the point of rest for us as a solar system within our galaxy is to be as close to the center of our galaxy as we can because in terms of overall motion we wouldn't have to be trying to do the sidewise zoom we could just be turning slowly like the center of the hurricane does if we could just get closer to it so we're shedding it we're shedding energy all the time as as our solar system and our planet moves towards the center of of our galaxy and, and you can see it in the mountain building how our planet is slowly cooling and shrinking and, and to accommodate you know it's its new sizes and it'll maybe shift the magnetic poles around that may or may not matter too much I don't know we'll have to wait and see when it if we get any serious flip-flops in a magnetic pole I don't know if it'll be serious or not we it might screw up the power grid for a couple of days but I think it won't I don't know what it would do. <laughs> Not prepared to get into that. I was talking about time and I'm up to nearly 30 minutes. I don't know if that was any help or not. Uh, time is a measurement. It's not a place or a thing. And you have to ask yourself how fast is fast and how slow is slow and how big are the things 
with which you're dealing. Size matters, so time is relative to how the observer sees it, how big both the observer and the observed are relative to, to each other. That's, that's going to make time seem a bit wonky, which Einstein totally missed. He missed a few other things, too. So bye-bye from Butch. Now I'm going to click you off here. I got you on you. I got you in my sights. Fire the photon torpedoes.